afternoon. This is the afternoon session of the House Health Care Committee on February uh, 10th. Um, our chair is here, but uh, I'm taking over for a little while um, to uh, coordinate the meeting this afternoon. And we have several members from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, present and on the agenda. Um, uh, Susan, Barrett, did you have a preference or a, a plan of who was going to present this afternoon? Yes, I do. Would you like me to share that plan with you, Representative Donahue? Sure. Okay, good afternoon. For the record, this is Susan Barrett. I'm the Executive Director of the Green Mountain Care Board. I am joined today uh, by Sarah Lindbergh, who is our Director of Data and Analytics, actually her full title, I had to look it up so I got this right, Director of Health Systems Data and Analytics. Um, I'm also joined by Jean Stetter, who is our Budget Director. Um, and then I don't see her on the call, but she might be able to join a little bit later. I wanted to introduce you to um, a doctor from Dartmouth-Hitchcock, who is actually working with us as part of her leadership in preventive medicine residency. So she's a fellow in infectious disease, um, but she is, and I'm looking to see if she's joining us. I don't see her yet. Um, she is doing some a government uh, rotation with us at the board. Her focus is on health equity. So hopefully she'll get a chance to pop in. I know she was seeing patients this afternoon, so she was gonna try to duck out of clinic to pop on. Um, for the majority of the presentation, Representative Donahue, I, I will turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh, but um, Jean and I are here to add, but I think she, um, will be the person to be able to set the stage for you on um, the ask that we have and the work that we're doing around um, getting claims um, or insurers to provide race and ethnicity data on their claims. Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. So if you wanna uh, introduce yourself and join us, please. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, this is Sarah Lindbergh. As Susan said, I head up a data and analytical team for the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm here today uh, to present some information. I'll bring that up for you. <clears throat> All right. Is everyone able to see the slides? All right. So uh, my Objective here today is to introduce you to the healthcare database that is stewarded by the Green Mountain Care Board. Talk about some of the current limitations we face related to race and ethnicity data, both here in Vermont and more broadly, and introduce a few of the strategies we've been pondering to help address those limitations and give you um, a couple examples of the ways that we would hope to apply better data in this area. So our healthcare database has two main sides. VCures or VHCures stands for the Vermont Healthcare Uniform Reporting and Evaluation System, rolls off the tongue. That's a all payer claims database or APCD, which Vermont was an early adopter of these types of databases. So our data actually goes back to 2007. And it's a bit of a misnomer. It really should be the most payer claims database since we aren't uh, getting data for 100% of the insured market here in Vermont. But we estimate that we are getting um, at least 85% of that information. And we do get claims submitted for Medicare and Medicaid, which are governmental payers, as well as commercial insurers, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. And uh, it's based on where people live. So whether the person gets care inside Vermont or out of state, we're gonna get their medical and pharmaceutical claims in that data set. The other side of it is the hospital discharge data set or VUDS, the Vermont Uniform Hospital Discharge Data Set. 
And that's one of the most uh, longstanding data collections. That goes back to the 1980s, and it's a fairly consistent way that states collect information from hospitals. So that is for care that is delivered in Vermont, whether the patient lives in Vermont or comes uh, to us from out of state. Um, there are some limitations associated with that data set. Um, one that's probably most relevant to our conversation here is that it only is the facility side of the care, um, which can really limit some of our perspective, particularly for outpatient services. So whenever I'm talking about healthcare data, it's a bit of a joke <laughs> among my team, but um, I like to think about both the resident perspective and the provider perspective. So resident meaning where does the patient live or the person live? And that's the left-hand portion of this slide. So are, are they from Vermont or are they from outside Vermont? And then where was that care delivered? Was it delivered in Vermont or outside of Vermont? So outside of, you know, essentially benchmarks or comparative information for people who live outside Vermont and get care outside Vermont, I'm not too worried most of the time, uh, but for the rest of it, uh, so as you can see, vCare is, again, with most insured residents, whether they get that care in Vermont or outside of Vermont, whereas the discharge data is largely a provider look. So the facility discharges from our 14 community hospitals. We actually recently were able to also include the Brattleboro Retreat in that data collection and are in the process of adding the ambulatory surgical centers. Uh, we also have data sharing agreements with our neighbors, New Hampshire, New York, and Massachusetts. Unfortunately, um, data sharing has gotten surprisingly complex in recent years, so we're a bit delayed in getting those uh, Vermont resident discharges from them, but we're in the process of getting caught up. Um, New Hampshire in particular is a big piece of the puzzle, so we know how important that is. So uh, race and ethnicity data is what I consider a known unknown um, as you've been hearing about, I'm sure um, there are significant limitations in the information available um, to researchers such as ourselves and policymakers, providers related to good, and by good I mean reliable and valid information related to race and ethnicity. It's an identified gap that persists despite some attention to it, and I'd say there's um, other factors that can come into that picture and intersect, such as language is really important in the healthcare setting. Immigration status can also be a big deal or citizenship status. So these things kind of can all intersect in ways that affect people's interaction with the healthcare delivery system. But this framework I find helpful was introduced by Kilborn et al. Um, back in 2006, and I think it still really stands up, and that is really to reduce or, or approach any sort of disparity in healthcare, you must understand it. And to really understand it, you really need to be able to detect it. And so we're weak today in being able to detect racial disparities in the healthcare database. And this is something that's much broader than Vermont. Um, actually, Gene Setter uh, brought in an article to my attention where um, in the, when the CDC was talking about the first months of rolling out the vaccinations, uh, race and ethnicity data were missing for about half of the um, vaccination records. And so being able to track that is, is uh, really vexing them at a national level. And given the seriousness among the um, people of color and correlation, um, you know, comorbidities that might be associated with race and ethnicity, um, that's, a, that's a big deal um, in trying to track it. So uh, the current state of race and ethnicity data in the healthcare database, it's two different stories. So in the discharge data, each facility does collect race and ethnicity data, and those data are submitted to us in a de-identified format, but it does include the reported race and ethnicity. So our vendor does uh, great work in terms of just uh, making sure that the, va the values that are submitted uh, make sense. They're acceptable values of what we would expect, so they're consistent in that way. They check for trends over time to make sure there's a crazy jumps um, that would be unexpected. And they also at a very high level just monitor to see if the rates of discharges they're seeing seem to reflect the underlying population. However, there's been no official kind of audit of that information, and my suspicion is there's probably a lot of differences between the facilities and how they might collect that information. Can we just uh, pause for a minute? I see we have a, a question from the chair. I love being on the other end of this, being able to raise my hand. And, um, actually, it is a question that comes up anytime we're talking about race data, and uh, is this, 
self, is this a self report or is this a report by someone else? And how are the categories, who, who's determining what are the appropriate categorizations? And uh, there can be significant limitations built in, even if you say, oh, we get race data. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is actually one of the focuses. We, we currently are doing what we call an enhanced data validation work group. And that's one of the very things we're trying to understand is, is how much variability there is and how that data, those data are collected today and, and um, you know, how good we feel about it, how consistently it might be collected. But that's an absolute, like right on the nose point of the type of things that we want to kind of interrogate in that data set. Uh, DCARES is a different story. Um, so that's submitted by payers and the payer may or may not even collect race and ethnicity data, um, at least in the commercial market. And the, the submission of it is currently optional. So the elements that we collect as part of the all payer claims database are part of a rule. What's great about that is they're really consistent and nobody has to worry about crazy changes. The challenge about that is then if we need to make changes to reflect any old thing that might change, uh, we have to go through the rulemaking process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But uh, there were, as it was explained to me, there were two main reasons that choice was made back in 2008 when this was set up. One had to do with um, just the limitations. Uh, payers either felt like they didn't have that data or it was not good data. Unfortunately, some of that still may be true. Um, and the other concern is that, again, we were an early adopter of um, all payer claims databases. And one of the principal things that people were optimizing for was patient privacy and protection. And, a, you know, over a decade ago, Vermont had an even wider composition than it does today. And so there were more concerns that including that might increase the risk of re-identifying a patient in this data set. So, uh, you know, some of the, these issues still are at play today, but we think our calculus has changed just in the manner that we think that race and ethnicity data are crucial in trying to understand disparities. And that's why we feel it's appropriate to address. Uh, we could take another pause here. Uh, Representative Peterson has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, what do you mean when you say ethnicity data? What's that? Sure. Um, so ethnicity is traditionally two options. You're either Hispanic and, or Latino or not. So ethnicity um, is different than race. So race, um, the you know, they're big no, five categories yeah. federally. No, yeah, I know it's yeah. different, but so you're only identifying uh, Spanish or Latino. That's the way ethnicity is currently encoded um, in the way that we're collecting it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, so to talk about some of the strategies that we've been contemplating at the Green Mountain Care Board for addressing these limitations, um, I'll go over three today. One is um, developing a standardized approach for collecting race, ethnicity, and language information. The second is requiring race and ethnicity data be submitted to the all payer claims database VCURES. And the third is uh, thinking about ways to integrate our data with others, such as the Vermont Health Information Exchange. So when we talk about standardizing um, the way that we collect this information, uh, I think that that's a, a really one of those things that sounds really easy, but is uh, actually a pretty big undertaking and one that would involve substantial resources. And I would hope that as a state that we work together to get it right. But if we are able to collect race, ethnicity, and language information in a uniform way, that would make the data more reliable and valid over time across different data sources and in different settings that people might be interacting with the healthcare system. Um, by adopting conventions of how the information is solicited, we also might get more complete data. So just the way that you frame a question might make someone more or less likely to skip that question. So if we really are careful about the way that we frame it, we hopefully would get more complete information. Um, sometimes these questions confuse people. Um, they don't know, um, you know what you're really getting at with the way it's framed or if it's not available in the language that they speak um, best. Then uh, I think if we have it in a consistent format, they'd be more likely to increase familiarity and hopefully reduce some of that confusion. Um, and 
this is one part that might be getting at part of what representative uh, the previous question was about. And that is that um, CDC does maintain a code set that has over 900 different values for this, these types of variables. And that's really important, um, especially um, if you think about a provider. So as an example, I spent a couple of years living in uh, Minneapolis in the early aughts. And at that time, um, you know, there, and I'm sure there still is a really large Hmong population. And so they may be Asian. And so is, you know, maybe someone who um, was adopted and is Korean of Korean descent or someone who's been in the United States for generations and is of um, Indian American descent. So Asian can mean a whole lot of things by having these more refined categories, you can tailor interventions and more, um, more, um, just more robustly kind of identify where there might be some potential disparities. Um, for instance, with the Hmong population, there was a, yeah, I think a really good impulse to put things in Hmong uh, in written materials. However, uh, we, it turned out that, you know, most of the Hmong population that uh, we were dealing with in the public education system didn't, weren't literate. The parents didn't read Hmong. So they, what they really needed were, were interpreters. And so being able to address that kind of concern really requires this kind of refined um, categorization that you can also roll up to more um, meaningful subgroups from at least the Office of Management and Budget Budgets perspective, um, which is what a lot of federal programs use for um, race, racial information. Um, and, you know, if we are able to come together and come up with a, a good approach um, that we can standardize, then we could kind of roll it out throughout the delivery system and, and at the state of Vermont at large. And, you know, th this would be something that would probably require a lot of really careful thought and, and con con in collaboration to get right and continue to revisit to make sure that we're continuing to use best practices. So if I could ask a question at this point on that last uh the le prior, yeah, when, when you're talking about uh, we in terms of, um, you know, what kind of uh, conventions, for example, that will make people more um, feel more comfortable with answering questions or what kind of approaches should be extended, who, who um, who's are the we, who, who's involved in that conversation and discussion? Yeah, so, so far, um, I've really only been privy to it through um, the planned work for our enhanced data validation work group. So this is related to the data assets managed by the Green Mountain Care Board, but I would love that to be a much broader conversation <laughs> and be happy to participate in anything that it may already be planned. Well, uh, I guess that, yeah, that was the indirect question is what, whether it involved some of the um, members of these communities themselves that would be critical, I think, to getting it right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so in terms of requiring the race and ethnicity data to be submitted to our all pair claims database, um, right now we're really just trying to assess the quality of existing information maintained by the um, payers and facilities uh, who are submitting data to our respective uh, databases. And you know, our, our opinion is that uh, we think we, there's a lot of work to do to improve that quality before it makes sense to require its submission. Just because, you know, if if we're going to just collect garbage or or that if we force them to submit it and it's missing, there's not much value to gain there. So um, we have been working on the work group since last year, and we hope to wrap that up in May of this year. And and we also hope soon to launch a rule change for the VCURES data. So as I said, it's, uh, I think the rule is from 2008, so it's long overdue for a revisit. And uh, the current plan is we have drafted two separate rules, one dedicated to the submission of data and the other dedicated to the release of that data. And in the submission rule, we hope to um, have a companion guide where we are able to um, have the elements uh, a little bit more nimble to update. Um, and that's for reasons um, particularly uh, related to interoperability standards at the federal level. So they are making uh, insurers set up ways to exchange information more readily. And so if we could leverage that sort of um, data exchange, we would re reduce burden on the payers and also might be able to get additional information that we're interested in, such as um, the premiums that people pay for health insurance. We have a question from Representative Page. 
Yes. Um, how long have you been collecting this data? And, and could you tell us a little bit about the data that you've already collected? Have you, have you had an opportunity to analyze it or, or you know? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the hospital discharge data we've been collecting since the 1980s and the um, claims data we've been collecting since uh, 2009, but the data go back to 2007. So we analyze it as a matter of course in, in all our business. And uh, anytime you see something related to uh, cost, that's usually got V cures under the hood. Uh, the Blueprint for Health is one of the power users of the claims database. Uh, VDH uh, uses both sides of it, but especially um, the discharge data. But, but what does it tell us about our rate and ethnicity uh, for the state? Does that do you have any of that information available? So, the, yeah, the only um, payer in GCURES that really has race and ethnicity data is Medicare. And that population I just checked in 2020 is 98% white, which makes sense given that we know a lot of our um, populations of color are younger and therefore less likely to be covered by uh, Medicare. Uh, and then for the uh, discharge data set, I didn't do a, a perusal of that, but that um, that's the care delivered at Vermont hospitals, and it is anyone who seeks care at that hospital. And so that does have race and ethnicity data and has in, uh, since its inception. Uh, Representative Goldman. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is sort of what's the denominator? How many people are you talking about when you're talking about these data sets is my first question. And when my second question is, when you talk about a rule change, where does who's responsible for that rule change? Where does it sit? Oh boy, um, I'll take the first question first. <laughs> so uh, the all payer claims database again, we we think we're covering about eighty five percent of the insured market in Vermont. So we know we don't have the uninsured or people, um, you know, that uh, the other main missing piece uh, pieces are federal employees, uh, military plans. And then uh, self-funded groups, um, since a Supreme Court decision, uh, don't have to submit their data. So we're missing self-funded groups that choose not to submit their data to the all-payer claims database. But we think we, again, have over 85% of the insured market. Yeah, um, the I, hospital discharge. Number. Yeah, what, what is that number? Eight, what's the absolute number? 85% of what? Oh, uh, so it's about 625,000 Vermont residents. Um, we have good. just under... Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's a resident base. Yeah. Okay. So 85% of all Vermonters you have, you think you're having data on is what you're saying? Uh, so you want to take about six, 605 is probably the insured portion of that. Yeah. 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 So 85% of 600,000, let's say. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay, um, and then for the rule change, um, gosh, I, I probably won't do this justice. I, uh, rule making uh, and changing rules in the state is a established procedure and uh, you have draft rules that you present uh, and those are then go through a, a stakeholder process. They go through two different legislative committees, ICAR and LCAR, not sure what those stand for, but uh, that, that's a whole, um, that's a whole process that takes quite a bit of time. So, you know, we're optimistically hoping we might get through that process um, by next winter. Uh, but that some of that is really out of our hands. Yeah, most of our new members don't, but we've yeah, never we gone through the, the explanation of, of that long uh, process. So we'll, we'll need to follow up at some point. So that yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. If I may, I might just mention, um, I'm not sure if it's appropriate in this instance, but we also have the authority to change rules by statute. Right. So there are situations in which, uh, depending on what's required, things can go faster. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then once we go through that process, whatever path it might take, um, at that point is when we would really um, take a thorough re, uh, look at the data elements that exist today and update that submission guide. And requiring the submission of race ethnicity is, is almost a no brainer that we would um, contemplate at that point. Um, and hopefully in the interim, we've done a good job of improving the quality of that information so that we, when we start collecting it, hopefully next year, it would be meaningful. 
Um, so then probably in my mind, the most exciting idea that uh, is on the table uh, over at the Green Mountain Care Board is the idea of data integration. So that means combining different data sources at a person level to try and expand the utility of that information. So one example is, um, so, you know, medical and pharmaceutical claims are essentially just the bill that the provider sends to your insurer to say, this is how much we want to be reimbursed for that service. So it's really good at tracking some things, but not so good at tracking other things. So if we were able to connect the medical claim of a birth with the information on a birth certificate, we'd be able to really round out some of the information about that baby. So it's, it's APGAR score, the weight of the baby. And I think what's most exciting to people uh, trying to work on interventions in this area is connecting it to the parents. So right now, a medical insurance family might not match up that well with the actual family that the baby is born to. So um, that could, you know, with appropriate, um, you know, stewardship and making sure that access is appropriate, um, that could really add some really interesting insights to people working in that area. Um, similarly, if we're able to connect to death certificates, we would have the cause of death, which can be really intriguing for some research that's going on. Uh, Right now, if someone just disappears from the database, we're not always sure if they moved away, if they passed away, if they lost insurance. So that would um, at least help us figure out um, what was going on in the case of death. So one of the prime sources that people talk about in integration is the clinical information contained in the Vermont Health Information Exchange, which is uh, in your you know, electronic medical record, electronic health record, people call it different things, but that's the system that the provider is looking at in the hospital and connecting that with um, the information from that that's shared with the HIE, connecting that with the medical claims so that we can really round out the information that we're able to provide to the people providing care, to researchers working on uh, interventions in this area and public health workers. Uh, we know that the VHI already contains race and ethnicity data, so that would just be one of the additional um, elements that we would hopefully be able to gain from such an integration. So I, I have a question about that series of bullet points, and it's sort of a broad one, so you can uh, maybe answer part of it or the extent you can. How does all of that interplay with um, patient privacy protections? Yep, it's a great question and something that we wouldn't undertake lightly. So, uh, you know, vital records are one of the first uh, areas that we're interested in pursuing. And so we would do that, you know, with the support of legal uh, representatives on both sides and certainly want to hear from patients. But uh, we would want to know, you know, if the cost outweighs the risk in that case and how we would um, best protect it. So we have a pretty hefty process for releasing the data to folks who are interested in it. And so my uh, hunch is that if the, any of these integrated data sets would by necessity have a more, even more uh, rigorous application process and review process um, so that we know that uh, the information is being kept safe. Uh, so our data is always released in a de-identified format. So, um, you know, the connections would only be to ID numbers. They wouldn't be by a person's name or, or anything like that. So uh, we feel very strongly that we want to, you know, maintain privacy. That's a really important uh, consideration in any of these efforts. Representative Page. Yes, I was just curious, what is the cost of collecting all of this data and distributing it, um, cost and personnel and time, as well as, as money for the Green Mountain Care Board for all of this work. If that's in a future slide and you want to wait and answer, but if it's not, uh, go for it. Yeah, I guess um, I, I don't have those costs at my fingertips. I don't know if Jean Stutter might be yeah, better. Jean student. might be able to follow. This is Susan. We can, um, we can follow up with that. That's carved out specifically in our budget. So we can forward that on to you, Representative Page. You couldn't just tell me, uh, you know, a ballpark uh, or? 
Jean, do you have a ballpark number? I don't want to get it wrong. That's no, why I brought Jean sorry. along. Thank you. For the record, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm Jean Stetter, um, budget director at the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, there's two things representative page. Um, the, um, Sarah talked about first the rule change work um, and that is in the, uh, you know, projected between like 80 and $85,000, which for the Green Mountain Care Board would be 40% general fund and 60% bill back. And then the subsequent work for the data integration is, is estimated to be in that same ballpark for cost. Um, so, so that is, that is what we have as our cost. Um, I think Representative Page, you were alluding to the work um, that would be undertaken by providers as they're asking this question. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how to um, quantify that. I do know that providers take in a lot of information about individuals. So I, I don't know what the incremental um, time would be for adding those that question or those questions. We have a couple other questions right now. I, I, I'll just add a point of clarification if I'm correct. Those budget figures and therefore moving ahead on this are, are not currently in your budget request. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you, Representative Donahue, for clarifying that. So that's um, what we identified as the cost, um, and it's not currently in our budget. Uh, Representative China. I, I just am curious uh, to learn more, and it doesn't have to be necessarily right now, but I'm curious to learn more about how you extract, like what kind of clinical information you're extracting, how you're sharing it, how people are consenting or not consenting to that, because when most people go to get health care, I don't think they're going there with the thought like, I'm going to be contributing data about myself to some greater cause that I that is not yet identified. And so, and there might be things that people's data are used for that they don't personally agree with. And if we're just harvesting data and and providing it to the people at, the, at a high level, even if you're separating, identifying information from that data, you're still extracting from the suffering of people like we, you know, as a system are still extracting from the suffering of people. And so even if we're using it for what we might consider to be good, I'm just curious, like how much are we respecting people's rights and power and that? And, and, um, and like, so I guess I'm just curious to know more about what that clinical information is. Like, are we going to be, for example, in psychotherapy, are we going to be as an algorithm going to be scanning all of the notes and looking for patterns of words and extracting something from that? Because that's very different than just saying, here's the ages of people. So I'm curious if you have any more to share about that. Sure. And so this work is uh, to be determined. So those are the types of questions that we would expect to be grappling with um, in any planned integration effort. Um, to date, the only clinical integration with vCares of which I'm aware is through the Vermont Blueprint for Health. And they took information from the Vermont Clinical Registry while that was still up and running. And that was fed through the VHI to the clinical registry and folks had the option to opt out of data sharing. Um, I believe it was even opt in at that point for the, for the, the most of the life of the clinical registry. And uh, I believe the information that was used was pretty limited, um, just test, I mean, not just, but uh, it largely was test results and uh, things like, um, you know, bl uh, blood tests for related to diabetes and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think that all this is really important stuff to be considering and making sure that we're responsible. Representative Goldman. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could give an example of how you use the data to inform your policy so that we have a clearer idea of why it's important to collect the data whatever it may end up being and how it gets used in a forward thinking kind of way. Sure, uh, yeah, so this uh, data set, the All Peer Claims Database is really the state's only clear lens about the claims-based expenditures that Vermonters are incurring. 
So it's one of the bedrock data sources for our expenditure analysis. It also was the data source that was used for planning the all pair model and is using used to measure the total cost of care while we're monitoring it. Uh, it also um, it helped the Blueprint for Health get set up with the primary care medical homes and was the first chance providers ever got to see um, some of the outcomes among their patient population. Um, those are a few examples. Uh, we do allow uh, external researchers to apply for the information. A recent example that I thought was pretty interesting was um, the uh, RTI International was uh, able to use our data and look at uh, treatment patterns among opioid dependent folks and found some, uh, you know, raised some uh, concerns about uh, people who might be tapering too rapidly. So th those are just a few examples off the top of my head. That's great. That makes it a little more real, I think. All right. Um, so, uh, and maybe this is also to the point is what would we do if we were to have better race and ethnicity data in these data sets? Um, and I think one of the major things going back to, to reduce the disparity, you first need to be able to detect it. And so our partners over at the Department of Health have had a longstanding mission to help, um, you know, evaluate and understand and reduce disparities based on race and ethnicity. And so this would give them kind of another tool in their toolkit as they're looking at some of these issues. Um, and across the state, there are many initiatives that we would hope that this information could help better inform with those variables. And uh, I, I'll leave you with two examples that are at the top of my mind. So um, this is uh, data just for convenience I got out of an uh, article that's in pre-publication phase by Fetton et al related to um, the fatality rates uh, for among COVID-19 patients in the United Kingdom. And uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you, you see there's clearly uh, age factor. So those under 65, 2.7 per 100,000 uh, had died during the time period of study versus um, 147 in the 65 plus. That's the data that we have today in our database. Um, if we were going to expand that and then add the dimension of race, and in this case, they just quanti quantify it as white or black, um, we would miss the fact that in both age groups, the fatality rate is twice as high among black uh, per people. Uh, so 2.5 versus 5.4 among the under 65 and 142 versus 321 in the 65 plus. So that's just a really uh, sobering uh, area, blind spot of which we're aware, but um, something that I think we need to do a better job addressing, at least in the data available to us. Um, and the other example has to do with substance use treatment. So one of the kind of neat things in my mind about um, the claims database is that we have eligibility records for people, whether or not they seek care. So if someone has health insurance but isn't going to see a provider, we still know they're there. So if there are concerns about particular subpopulations who are deferring care or otherwise aren't seeking care that we would expect at a, a you know kind of benchmark rate, we're able to get a better insight about that than data sources that um, rely on someone actually coming to see a provider. Um, we also receive the data in a de-identified format. So the um, information is transformed into a hashed string of, of numbers and letters <laughs> before it comes to us. So that means that uh, submitters don't need to redact claims related to substance use treatment um, because patient confidentiality is of utmost importance to that population and has been mandated by a federal regulation known as 42 CFR Part 2. Um, we know we have an advantage of seeing some information that a lot of our partners across the healthcare delivery system uh, might not. And so putting those two things together, we feel like we could really um, do some interesting things to try and figure out if there might be some race, racial or ethnic disparities in those um, populations uh, for this kind of hard to get at information. So that was all I had. I'm happy to take any other um, questions that people might have. Do you have any questions? I guess they mostly were, were asked as we went along. 
Um, I, oh, here we go. Sorry, uh, Representative Houghton. Sorry. Um, and I apologize because I missed the first couple minutes. Um, so if this was answered. So if I guess my question would be if if we are looking to better understand health care disparities in our state and we don't have access to this data integration, what will we be able to determine? Sure. Um, so if we are able to improve the quality of the race and ethnicity data maintained by payers and then in, uh, make it a mandatory variable to submit, even if we don't add any other data, we've already enriched um, the, the all payer claims database. But it sounds like if we stayed status quo, would it be difficult to get to where we're trying to go? I, I think it would, and, and as I alluded to, the, you know, there are intersections with other um, variables such as socioeconomic status, uh, immigration status uh, that um, aren't, aren't visible either in a clinical record necessarily or a claims record. And so the more as a state we can come together and come up with some more holistic pictures, knowing that there are important trade-offs to consider related to privacy, um, I, I think, you know, there's some risks in, in not trying to take advantage of that information. Great, thank you. Uh, Representative Peterson. Yes, uh, could you go back to the last slide? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I lost you there and I just wanna. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. It was my, it was my fault. Go. I got. Uh, sure. I oh, it was a lot of detail, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let they say care. So do we have data on this? We have de-identified information, yes. So I don't know who is who that person is, but I, I do have records of substance use treatment in a de-identified form. So we have data on the subject. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. <clears throat> Now, um, uh, I guess back to Susan Barrett, what is, did you have any other comments from you or any of the other uh, people here or were they just for backup questions? I see we have uh, Jean Stetter was. Yeah, yep, Jean uh, was here for, for backup if there, and she backed up beautifully. Thank you, Jean, uh, for budget questions. Oh, are you on mute, Jean? Did you wanna say something else? Sure. No, I'm not on mute, but I didn't okay. want to talk over you. So okay. that um, was just, go, ahead. go ahead, Susan. No, no, no. Go. There was just a couple things I wanted to, um, you know, kind of highlight. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board has a very robust data governance process mm -hmm. that that covers the um, the release of our data. Um, so I just you know, that, that could be a conversation for another time, but there's a, there's a robust process in place. And I think Sarah, you know, um, I think it would be appropriate to say that we're, our process is a model for other, other groups thinking about releasing their data. Um, the other thing is, is VCures is used by VDH. You know, it kind of, even though it resides at the Green Mountain Care Board, um, you know, Diva, Blueprint, VDH, they all have seats into the database to access it. Um, so I just wanna, it's something that has longer fingers. And the last thing I wanted to say to, you know, Sarah's point about really um, um, getting standards about what you list, um, that CDC thing that you referenced. So if only 50% of the people, the federal government said, if only 50%, they're trying to determine, are we doing a good job or not in terms of getting the vaccine to the BIPOC community? So if 50% doesn't have any information at all, in the, in the information that was reported, the biggest classification was unknown. So, um, so that just means it's difficult to measure something that they want to measure. Um, so anyway, Sarah, you're better at this, so I'll defer. 
<laughs> those were the things I wanted to highlight. Thanks, Dean. I'm glad you brought up the Data Governance Council because um, I, I don't like to brag, but it, I'm bragging because we've been working on data governance, oh gosh, since like maybe 2015. Um, and we have, as Jean referenced, other state agencies are emula emulating our Data Governance Council. I think we have an advantage because we're smaller you know, VDH has so much data and AHS has so much data, um, but we have done a ton of work on um, data governance and it is about oversight of releasing data, but it's also being stewards of that data and we, where, where we're going with that data. So we meet every couple of months. I'm the chair of that council. We have membership from um, Blueprint for Health, VDH, although the VDH folks have been really tied up lately, um, as well as by state primary care and others. So thank you, Jean, for bringing that up. You have a web page yes. on, on your website that, that if people wanted to look for more information yep. about the council. Yeah. I will send that to you. So questions? Yeah, and while you're there, there's uh, plenty of uh, examples of what we do with that information. So there's interactive reports and you know, yeah. fixed reports and uh, external reports, but uh, give you a sense of the application. That would be a great resource to spend some time looking at. Okay, it looks like that's it for our questions. Thank you. I think this was uh, very helpful. I don't know if any of you have had a chance yet to look at uh, the new bill that was introduced uh, just yesterday, um, H210, on uh, health disparities. And there are references in it about, uh, you know, data collection, and it might be interesting for, you know, sort of a cross-comparison look at what the uh, um, what the uh, administration's uh, equity director's recommendations, what the bill recommends and what you're looking at and uh, see where the intersectionality is or isn't. But thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for having, having us. us. So I think probably we're well time for at least a brief, um, it's only been 45 minutes, but but uh, if we don't take a very brief break now, um, we'd be interrupting our, our uh, next witness midway. So maybe we should take a you know, five minute uh, stretch break and, uh, and then come back.